How fast is your algorithm? Can you make it faster? These are critical questions you'll be asked in a coding interview. But how do we go about uh, figuring out what the time complexity of our algorithm is? Well, it relies on understanding big O notation. Consider a sorting algorithm. So the larger the list of numbers that you want to sort in either ascending or descending order, uh, the longer it's going to take for that to occur. So it doesn't really make sense to say, well, on my computer, it takes one second to sort a list of five numbers. Um, whereas on someone else's computer, they might be able to sort a hundred, you know, numbers in fractions of a seconds. Um, it's not really a fair comparison. So a better way to do this is using big O notation. We don't measure the speed of our algorithm in units of time. We could, um, but it's not a very clear comparison. Take for the instance that you're using two different pieces of hardware. Well, the, very, the different hardware will have different uh, computing powers for one thing. Um, but even if you're using the same hardware, um, one of your computers might be attending to some background processes or other tasks that it's running. Um, so it's not really um, a fair comparison to use time in seconds or anything like that. Um, and probably the biggest reason for this is because algorithms often they take in um, as an argument something that varies in uh, size. So for example, uh, an array can be a thousand um, elements long or 10,000 or something like that. So the code that we've actually written, it's not only going to vary in time, um, even on the same computer that executes it one after other with the same inputs, um, but with various hardwares and, you know, the various length of array inputs, um, it's just, it's not a good way to measure it. So a better way to measure the efficiency of the algorithm is to use what's known as big O notation. So big O notation with this method, we only care about the significant factors as arguments. This method, we're interested in the algorithm speed based on the argument approaching an infinite size list. So rather than thinking, okay, sorting five elements or a hundred elements, we're thinking for our sorting algorithm, well, what happens when the length of the list approaches a million or a billion? Um, because, you know, large companies, they use large amounts of data. Um, so solving a problem, it needs to be able to be efficient for these large um, inputs of data that get used. Um, opposed to thinking, oh, well, the time it takes is a second, we're thinking, okay, how fast does this algorithm run relative to the size of its input as it grows infinitely large? So let's start with a very simple example. And this function, it converts the degrees Celsius into, a, into the degrees Fahrenheit. So let's break this down. So when we call this function, we're going to pass in the variable. Uh, let's say we pass in 30 degrees Celsius. Um, and for primitive data types in TypeScript or JavaScript, uh, a copy of the variable is stored in memory. So we saw how um, in the previous video how that happens, how numbers are stored in memory. Um, and and that's also true for other primitive types, like booleans and stuff like that. Um, but then we have this calculation here. So we have the number, we times it by 1.8, and then we add on 32. So you might start to think, well, we're accessing a variable, performing a multiplication, and performing an addition. Um, and they all take different amounts of time. 
for the computer to process? And what if we have more complicated functions? Would likely make a mistake when we're counting, you know, trying to count the speed of things. Um, and the result wouldn't really convey much meaning as we sort of alluded to earlier. Um, so even if we did add all of those results together correctly, uh, in time terms of you know the speed of things um, based on those different operations and more complex operations um, it wouldn't really be conveying much meaning so the good news is that we don't actually care about doing this and we can simplify things um, to counting the number of times we access the memory slot so when we're trying to work out the time complexity we're just interested in the number of times we access a memory slot. Um, in addition to this, uh, we only care about the significant terms. So let's say we're accessing a number that takes up two memory slots instead of one. Well, we can simply say that this runs in constant time. In big O notation, constant time is O of one. Um, and technically, you know, this would be O of 2 for that particular example, but again, we only care about the significant terms, and we already have made some assumptions and generalizations. So, and the reason this is constant time is because, well, we just have one number here. Um, we have a copy of that memory slot. Um, so we're just looking for one... Um, Bit of memory or one byte of memory um, and then we're just doing our multiplication um, so we have we're taking a copy of the degree Celsius so we're assigning um, a byte of memory here provided that you know we've got a reasonable degree Celsius number um, and essentially since we're assigning one um, byte of memory there, um, or even if we're assigning multiple bytes, um, we round that to O of 1, which is constant time, which means the uh, memory complexity uh, or space complexity, we've only used one um, bit of memory, so that's constant memory, um, but it's also constant time complexity because time complexity as we just mentioned uh, we've simplified down we're not considering all the operations independently or anything like that we're just simplifying things to okay the times the amount of times we need to access memory so we do need to access the memory um, and look up just one bit of memory so both the space and time complexity in this case are going to be constant time and if I go over to this graph here, um, it turns out that um, linear time or O of 1, which is linear, that's the fastest time complexity. We can't get any faster than um, one memory lookup. And so that's the fastest memory we got. Now, Let's sort of look at the next example here. Um, but so firstly, constant time, that's the ideal run time for any function, but we can't always just make our code into constant time complexity because as you could imagine, you know, we might not just pass one value in, we might pass an array of size n in as an argument. So let's consider this function here. It's very simple. It's just log nums so it just takes an array of numbers and then for each number we have a for loop um well, we have a for loop for all the numbers and then we're just logging out the number so in this case here um well we're looping through all of the numbers and the array it could vary in size so recall that we're sort of thinking as the size approaches infinity or as the size of the array becomes large for most cases, unless specified otherwise. Um, so, 
So, oh, sorry, I think I might have made a mistake before. Before, we have constant time. I might have said linear time. This is linear time um, because it just occurs dependent on the length of the array. So it's directly the speed of the algorithm directly relates to how long the array is. And that makes sense, right? Because if you only had one number in the array, well, you know, you'd only have one memory lookup. But if you had 10, you'd have to look up 10 numbers. Um, and then we have this arbitrary uh, value uh, that we've assigned. Um, well, a, a generic value that we've assigned for a memory lookup uh, as relating to the time complexity. Um, so that's pretty much the generalized definition of time complexity is a memory lookup. And if we have an array of numbers, we're going to have to look up each of the array, each of the numbers in the array. So in this case, it's completely dependent. So in this case here, the Fahrenheit, we've got constant time complexity. Um, it's going to have a, well, it's going to have a space complexity, which you said right in space, we can just have uh, S here, space complexity of um, O of 1, because we're only assigning the variable degrees Celsius as we're taking a copy of it. Um, and we also have a time complexity of O of 1, because we have to look up the degrees Celsius in memory. Um, so that's just one. So again, even if we didn't pass an argument here or, you know, we pass multiple arguments and we had to look up two different arguments where that would be zero of two, um, we only take into consideration this significant term. So this would be O of one. Um, and then we have linear time here. So linear meaning, uh, Basically, the space time depends on, well, both the space and the time depend on the input. Um, now, that is not technically true for the space, um, but let's say we were to do something like this. Um, well, we do have to assign this variable here in the loop here. So we have the number, the numbers that are assigned in me uh, memory, but then we have this for loop where for each um, element in the array, um, we have to create a variable here for the index here. Now, we're using a let here. So technically, this would be O of 1 um, because we are reusing the same variable. So even though we have the index n number of times, um, you know, we're reassigning the same variable. So we're only using that much memory um, because we don't really need it for any other purposes other than logging it out. And then when we get to the next iteration, we don't need that variable anymore. Um, but you could have something where, like in a more realistic case, um, you're probably not just going to log out your numbers. You might be, you know, assigning a variable, for example. So you might, for example, you might have a array here. So you could have like, let array equal to this. And then when you log things out, rather than logging things out, or in addition to logging things out, you might say, well, to the array, we might want to push, um, you know, doesn't really matter exactly what, but two times the index, for example. Um, so not really sure why that's erring. Um, two 
So let's actually make this a number array. Okay, so that gets rid of that. Um, but as you can see in this case here, um, and it's probably why I initially had O of N here, is because in this case here, uh, when you're actually you know doing something based on the array or each element of the array, you're often doing something like this here. Um, but we're not doing that for our log case scenario. Um, so I'll just comment that out. Um, so let's think of another example. Um, and let's say, well, firstly, let's just, um, like sort of, so we've got O of one here because we only have one variable I because this time we've passed in numbers as an array. Um, so before we pass it in as a number, but now we're passing in as an array of numbers, which is going to give us, um, you know, like a pointer. So if we were to do some sort of operation here, like number uh, equals number plus one, that won't, that will only affect the number within this scope here, not the number outside of this function. Um, but here, if we mutate the array, uh, it's going to, it's not going to take a co copy of it. It's, it's a reference to it. So it's a pointer. So if we were to do something to nums, um, it's going to affect the variable outside of this scope, which is maybe what we want, but usually it's a bad practice to, do that unless there's um, reasoning behind that. Um, so essentially, in this case here, we're declaring a variable, which is O of one. Uh, in this case, we're referencing a pointer. So we're not declaring that variable at all, uh, other than in the first place. That was defined outside of the function. Um, so that's O of one. Well, we're not even assigning a bit of memory there at all. Um, but what is one bit of memory is um, this let i equals zero. And then we're going to loop through that. And then we're going to reassign it. And then, you know, JavaScript in the background is going to take care of freeing up the memory and uh, reallocating that. Um, but I just wanted to throw in this sort of caveat where if you had like, for example like a message here. So let's say you assign another variable here, const x equals, um, or let's say const message equals uh, log nums chord. And then we have a console log here and we const out, console log out the message here. Well, essentially, what we've done here is we've assigned another variable. So we have O of one, well actually this is a string here. Uh, so we're gonna talk about that in other videos. Um, but essentially each character relates to O of one. So this would be like O of whatever the length of this is. Say so it's, um, oh, what do I got here? 16 selected, so 14. So technically that would be O of 14, and then we've got this variable here, and assuming that the number is less than, you know, 128 and it's not negative, um, you know, we've got 15 bytes of memory there that were allocated to memory. So we'd have something like this, O of 15. But you can see that this approach, it's, it's very, this is what you might learn in university, and it might get more complex than this, and you count all the numbers and stuff like that, but it's very prone to error. Uh, I mean, I easily could have just, you know, you could have a long instead of a regular number or a negative number or, you know, any of these sorts of things could occur. Um, and in addition, it's not a significant factor anyway. So we don't even really care about it anyway because we just round down to O of 1. So um, let me just comment that out. Um, 
So I guess in the final example, I want to have a function here where I log the pairs of all of the numbers. So I'm going to take in the numbers once again. Um, and it's just going to return void for us. But essentially what I want to do here is I want to, if I have, say, the numbers 1, 2, 3, what I want to do is I want to log out all of the combinations. So one of the combinations will be um, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 3, 1, 3, 2, 3, 3. So to be able to do this, um, firstly, we're going to need to loop through all of our numbers. Um, and then we're going to need to loop through them again. And this time I'm going to make this J. And then I can log out the numbers I, J. So essentially what we've done here is okay so for the first number we've got one and then we want to get the pair so we loop through the numbers again um and then we get all the pairs of one so it's one 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 two one three and then we'll be on the second iteration of the numbers so then we'll be on two here and then we'll do the same thing again, 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3. Um, so if we compare this, and this is what's known as quadratic time complexity. Um, so it's got a space. Well, in this example where we're not um, declaring any memory, um, we've got an O of 1 space complexity um, and then we have a O of N times N or N squared time complexity um, so why is this N squared well we have a loop within a loop which means we don't have two loops, we have the length of the loop uh, squared, basically, because for every element in the array, in this case here, we're just looping through it, um, there's n numbers in it. But in this case here, you know, we can see we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 which is three squared because we've got a loop within the loop. So for each element in the array, we're going to need to go through and cycle through each of the elements again. And um, that ends up being n squared, as you can see by the numbers of pairs here. Um, so this is quadratic time. And as you can imagine, it's slower than linear time. Um, so if we look at the charts of things, um, we can start to see, okay, so we've got constant time at the start. We've got linear time second. Um, well, actually, that's not true. Um, we've got two other things here. Um, and then we've got O of N here. Uh, then we've got something here. Um, and then we've got O of N squared here. Um, so let me just go back to our function here. So a good rule of thumb for determining the time complexity of um, 
anything to the power of something is or determining time complexities for loops is basically for every nested loop you're adding one to the power of the time complexity so in this case we have one loop so we just got n to the power of one which is just n here we've got two well a nested for loop within a for loop um so that's going to be n squared you can imagine if we had another nested for loop so something like this and then we'll you know that j was a k and then we're logging out ijk that would be n to the power of three and that pattern will continue all the way on so n to the power of whatever um and it, it's getting worse and worse every single time um so they're sort of like the main time complexities um so just to look back at our chart again um so we've seen o of one that's the fastest time complexity because we're just looking at one memory slot um <clears throat> then we've got over here o of n which means we need to look at every memory slot in the array um We've got O of N squared here. I'm also going to tack on um, O of N to the power of, um, you know, whatever, X. Uh, that, that signifies that that could be N to the power of 3, N to the power of 4, N to the power of 5, where each power is getting worse and worse. Um, but you might be wondering why we're missing a few here. So one thing to note is, well, over here, um, we've actually got something known as logarithm time complexity. So we have O of uh, logarithm time complexity here, which we're going to discuss logarithm in the next video because it's really important. Um, and then by default, since logarithm times faster than linear time, you could imagine that if we had, you know, a, li a linear sort of thing multiplied by a logarithmic time complexity, since that is less than that, if you multiply that by that, it's going to be less than the n squared value. So if logarithm is completely foreign to you, we're going to dive into that in the next video. Um, but for now, you just need to take the wor my word on that one. Um, so basically, I think I've misaligned some of these bottom ones. I think there's a few more here. But basically, we have, um, you know, we have 2 to the power of n here. Um, and below that, we have n factorial. So... We'll see examples of these, but if you haven't seen a factorial before, that's just the number. So let's say we had five factorial. Uh, that would be like five uh, multiplied by four, multiplied by three, multiplied by two, multiplied by one. So that's worse. Like if you think about n squared, for example, if you had the number five, n squared would be 25. But here we've got 5 times 4, which is 20, times 3, which is 60, times 2, which is 120. Um, so you can see that that time complexity is worse. Um, and likewise, 2 to the power of, say, n is 5. Uh, what is that? 32, I think, which is bigger than um, 25. And this is especially true as the numbers get bigger and bigger. Um, so I think I missed the line this box here with this box here. Um, but around this sort of area here, you've also got, because, um, you know, you've got linear time, so you can imagine you've got a for loop. But imagine you have a for loop um, that's, you know, based on the root of the numbers, for example. So you could have like O of the square root of n. So if you had nine numbers, um, 
that you're looping through, but then every third number you're doing something. For example, uh, you might have this, you know, three, you're doing something for the three numbers there. You have the square root complexity there. Um, and then this could be cubic roots or whatever. So you could have that. So similar to how we got O N squared all the way up, you could have the inverse of that where the time complexity gets faster and faster or worse and worse, depending on which way you're looking at things. So a couple of more notes to be aware of um, is here we've got O of N and we could also have something where it's like O of N plus M. Now you might be thinking, well, you sort of said that um, well, we only take the significant terms and that would be true if we had like a for loop where let's say we had something like this, right? So let's say we copied this down here. Uh, oops, that was the wrong button. Uh, if I copy that down like that, here we have two for loops for the same number. So this would be two of n. O 2n, uh, which would simplify to O of n. Um, but we're thinking, like, let's say we had some other numbers, nums 2, uh, which would be a number array, and then we loop through that, and then we loop through that. So technically, you might think, oh, well, this would simplify to O of n as well. Um, but the thing is, it actually is going to be O of N plus M, um, where M is the number of elements in here. And the reason we can't simplify that, and we'll, this will make more sense when we go into some of the graph stuff, uh, where we have edges and vertices and um, nodes and stuff like that. Um, but we don't actually know the number in advance. So even though we're assuming the numbers are approaching a very large value, well, this could be a million elements, and then this could be a billion elements. And the billion elements would, um, you know, dwarf the million elements, and then that would um, be the significant term. <clears throat> but we don't know the length of the array in advance. Um, so if we just cut out one, even though we're saying O of N, well, N, you know, might represent 10 million and... M might represent a billion, so you're losing information there. Um, so hopefully that wasn't confusing. That will make more sense as we go into some of the graph stuff to unpack some of that. I just thought I'd mention that there. Um, so if we return to our time complexity here, we see O of N plus M. Well, O of N plus M is obviously going to be worse than O of N, um, but it's better than uh, you know any of the exponentials or anything like that. So a final thing I want to talk about is I've mentioned, I've, I've provided some really simple functions here, um, just logging things out. But if you've ever seen a sorting algorithm, or maybe perhaps just intuitively, let's say you have a list of numbers, um, and I have the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So you could imagine I'd have those exact same numbers, um, but maybe I'll have the numbers in reverse order. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, which is the complete reverse order. And then I might have something where it's like 1, 2, 5, 4, 3. So basically, where this is going is not all algorithms have just one time complexity. You can imagine if the numbers are already sorted and you choose a particular type of sorting algorithm, it's going to take way less time to sort this than it will the complete reverse of it. So this could be the best case scenario. This could be the worst case scenario. And then this could be like an average case. So in academic theory and in, in you know university and stuff like that, 
you may come across things, not just big O notation, but you might come across something known as big omega or um, theta case scenarios. So basically, well, the good news is we can avoid all of that stuff because in coding interviews and coding in general, we only care about the worst case scenario. And the worst case scenario is the big O time complexity, um, which is what we're looking at. But if you look at like some data structure algorithm books and stuff like that, you, you they'll go into these really complicated proofs proving, you know, the time complexity of things. Um, and that's completely unnecessary for what we need to do other than uh, unless you really enjoy, um, you know, mathematical proofs of um, data structures and algorithms, time complexities, uh, or you're studying for some university course or something like that, or a graduate course. Um, you know, we don't really need to know that information at all, but I just wanted to throw it out there that, you know, the best case scenario, um, that's known as big omega, I think. It looks like that. Um, and then you've got um, big theta, which is the average case scenario. Um, but we can simplify that. We don't have to do any of the proofs. We don't have to work it all out. We just consider, okay, well, what's the worst case scenario? And the worst case scenario is what we're um, trying to optimize our algorithm for. And that's why we have big O notation. I um, thought I'd just throw that in there because, um, you know, it might be some terms you come across and you think, oh, well, I need that for a coding interview. And then you make things way, way, way more complicated than it needs to be. But really, you just need to solve problems. And often you'll only find these sort of multiple solutions in things that are related to sorting and stuff like that. So we're going to cover sorting algorithms anyway. So we're going to see that. Um, but I'll just sort of, oh, I'll give you that sort of peace of mind that, okay, well, here's the awareness that this exists and it exists in the academic world and all that sort of stuff. But for us, we only really need to focus on the big O time complexity. Um, so that was probably a little bit of information in, that, in this video. Um, and I've really tried to spell things out and make it as easy as possible to understand. Um, so... In the next video, we're going to discuss this logarithm time complexity um, because logarithm time complexity, it's really, really important um, in solving problems. So to be able to understand what that actually means, we have to understand what a logarithm means. Um, so we're going to jump into that concept in the next video. But after that, that's all of the main concepts that we need to know for data structures and algorithms. So we'll be able to jump into our uh, array data structure and some other data structures and start solving some problems related to that. Um, so I'm excited to get into that. But yeah, there is, you know, at least some fundamental theory that you need to know and concepts. But other than that, we're going to avoid or introduce that as needed. Um, so thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.